uh, the title of our discussion here is uh, the panel discussion with parents of individuals with autism, what we wish professionals knew. And I have some wonderful parents with me on the panel uh, who will be um, engaging in this discussion today. So, um, I'll introduce myself first and then uh, if it's all right with everybody, I'll just go through some uh, housekeeping rules and then inshallah we'll go straight into our discussion. Uh, like I said, my name is Amina Maliki and uh, I'm a student at Emirates College for Advanced Education and I'm studying my Masters of Education in Applied Behaviour Analysis, ABA. I also am a mother and I have a 12 year old daughter, Maryam, uh, who also has uh, autism spectrum disorder. So um, uh, this is a really, uh, a really important discussion and uh, I'm very grateful for Dr. Cloda and, uh, and Dr. Michelle and all the ECA panel for uh, arranging it. So. Uh, I'll allow the panelists to introduce themselves in just a moment, but first uh, I have some uh, information for the audience, if that's all right. Uh, first of all, can you all make sure that your cameras and microphones are turned off? Um, and this means uh, that we'll just be able to see and hear the panelists. Um, so if you can just take a minute and check now, that would be great. So. Um, the format of today's discussion is that I'll be opening by asking a few questions to each of the panelists and then you'll have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat. If you would prefer to ask your question verbally, then uh, if you could please raise your hand, we'll, we'll call on you to turn your mic on. Um, so I'll also let you know when we're ready for questions from the audience because we do, uh, we would like to uh, involve you all in the conversation and allow for comments. So if there are any questions that are maybe not so relevant to today's uh, session, then, um, then, and we're not able to answer or we're not comfortable answering maybe, then we will be downloading the chat afterwards so that we can reply to any questions that we aren't able to uh, during the session itself. And we can also direct you to some resources that might help you. Uh, so for those of you collecting CEUs for the BACB certification, we will be sharing two codes in the course of the session. So kindly listen carefully and write them down. Please, please, please do not write them down in the chat <laughs> um, for the sake of ethics. Um, a link to a form will be sent at the end and you can enter those codes um, in order to get your CEUs. So yeah, like, like I said again, please do not share the codes in the chat. chat. This will mean that um, we are not compliant with our duties as an ACE provider. Um, so if you miss the codes, we provide many free CEU events so you can just um, get them next time. We look forward to a very interesting and engaging discussion today and we welcome any questions or comments that you have. So thank you very much. Welcome, I think we have all of our panelists available at the moment. That's wonderful. So if everybody's ready, then I would like to uh, introduce all the wonderful panelists uh, who have been kind enough to take the time out of their very busy schedules to share their wisdom with us today. Um, so please, uh, Marco, if you could tell us about yourself and your child with autism, that would be great. Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting us to be here. Uh, my name is Marco. I'm from Brazil. My wife is Bianca. She's not in. She's in the United States right now. So our daughter is. Her name is Clara. She is almost eight years old. She's going to turn eight at the end of the month. Uh, also in the spectrum, uh, she was diagnosed at age at age of two. 
Um, so we first started uh, the ABA in the United States for a month, and then when we returned to Dubai, we started, you know, uh, with the NIPAS program, uh, CLM at that time. So she attended the program like full time, 20 hours per week for two years in a row until the age of four. And then when she was accepted in the mainstream school uh, for FS1, and she continued for another one year and a half or two years as having four hours per week when she was then released. Um, nowadays, she's in a mainstream school, year two. Um, she still has the support of the uh, LSA, uh, shadow teacher, full time at school. Apart from that, she's not doing any uh, speech therapy in, anymore or OT. Well, we had to stop during the pandemic. And when she came back to school right now, she, uh, she was supposed to start the speech again. She did, in fact. But because this past two months, she's been going through some uh, difficult times uh, behavior, behavior wise. So we had to stop with the speech therapy right now and until we go back to the to the normal routine. And uh, yeah, that's it. But she's doing well. OT was really good for her since we started when she was two to uh, two to three years old until she was about six. It helped her a lot. Uh, for now, that's what you're doing. I'm working with her at home. Um, this we're going to start now with the support for her in the behavior uh, field because we need to be to make her to be more independent now at school or at home as well. And uh, yeah, because she's as I said, she's facing some behavior problems at school right now since we came back from the Christmas holiday. So we, we are having this extra support. Uh, she's verbal, by the way. And I think that's it. Thank you very way, much. Just, I, so I just didn't mention, uh, we are from Brazil. So English is not our first language. I'm a 50, almost 51 years old. And Bianca, I'm not going to tell her age. She's going to tell it by herself. <laughs> But we were kind of uh, we're quite late parents. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, and we really appreciate you uh, both coming on today and sharing um, uh, sharing you know your joy with your daughter. And um, and so I'll move on to Bianca then, so that she can add anything she wants to add. Perhaps not her age though. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for you all. I'm so happy to be here and to be able to share a little bit of our story with you all. And uh, yes, um, it's been a beautiful journey with our little Clara, ups and downs, um, a lot of learning. And, uh, and I feel it's what we are doing today, it's so amazing because we are able to learn with you and kind of like also share um, what worked for Clara and what didn't work for Clara. And of course, we learn with our mistakes and it's a, it's a beautiful journey. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Shall we move on to our next panelist, Khawla? Could you kindly introduce yourself? Oh, Khawla, I think you're muted. I am. I'm sorry. I have a really bad habit of talking while muted. Apologies. My name is Khaula Barley. Thank you so much for you know, allowing me to join this uh, panel today. Um, my son, I am the mother of three. My youngest is Abdullah and he is on the autism spectrum. Um, he just turned 14 years old this month, which I can hardly believe. Um, time has flown. I think Abdullah is highly verbal, um, highly engaging, but you know does have significant challenges in you know many and most uh, learning environments. I think one thing that is interesting about or a little bit unique about my um, 
autism journey, if you will, is that Abdullah was born um, with very significant health problems. So when he was born, immediately I was told that he had a very slim chance of surviving even the first you know, few days. Um, and then after that, uh, his prognosis for you know cognitive and physical functioning was very very low so over the course of the first few years as abdullah was able to learn to move and smile and connect um, we were thrilled and everything seemed like a win so for us when autism was brought up when he was you know around three um, it didn't really seem like a crushing blow uh, that I know some parents experience um, because the bar had been set so low for his outcome, you know, that by the time autism was thrown into the mix, it was kind of like, okay, well, what do we do about that? Um, so I do think that that makes uh, a unique kind of journey for, for us as a family. Um, Abdullah has been in the New England Center as a young child. Um, he's been in mainstream school, uh, is currently in Karama and going back into mainstream school. So it has definitely been a very, very bumpy and still is a bumpy ride um, with him. But, uh, you know, he continues to make progress and is now a pretty typical teenager on top of his autism. So that is that is where we are. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, you know, uh, it, that's that's what's really lovely about about you know this kind of discussion is that we hear about all the different backgrounds and so many people have different, like you said, autism journeys. Um, so, so Jada, if I can ask you to share your own, please. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me today to be part of this panel. Uh, I'm a parent and a professional here today. Um, uh, I have a son um, who has a diagnosis of autism. He is 23 and uh, I think he was diagnosed when he was two and a half and that's about 20, 21 years back. Um, hardly we knew anything about autism then. So it has been a tough ride and uh, now now he is fine. He is a, a young adult and he's quite independent. He goes to a center for young adults here and um, he loves to play the keyboard. Um, he helps us around the house uh, and um, he's good with computers. So he's a very happy uh, boy. Um, as as far as I, I am a behavioral therapist and I'm a certified coach in the competent learner model. I coach therapists in the competent learner mon model and I've been uh, working with NEPA for the past almost 10 years. So um, tough journey, but kind of, you know, is uh, we are on a good uh, spot now. That's really great. So you're a professional and a parent. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and can I just say, mashallah, you know, you don't look, you know, like you have a 23 year old boy. So <laughs> bravo. <laughs> I think I should thank him for keeping me like this on my keeping you young. <laughs> yeah. That is good. Um, can I uh, can I uh, is it Esma? Is Esma available to to introduce herself, please? Esma is having a lot of connection issues, so she's trying to move locations now, but I think if she joins, it's going to be after a few minutes, so maybe we should. Um, oh, she's saying that she can log, she's logged on, been able to log on with her phone. So yeah. let's see if, if she can join from there. We have someone whose name is Jihad, but uh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi everyone. Hi, is it Esma? No, this is me, Jihad. No, no, let me. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah, I'm just well, wondering. Well, nice to meet you, Jihad. Yeah. Could you kindly introduce yourself, if that's all right? Yeah, I'm Jihan. 
uh, I have a master degree in special education. I'm just recently have my master degree, as I told you, in special education. My son is 16 years old now with autism. He's a handsome boy. I'm proud of him. And uh, I'm struggling a little bit to find good vocational training for him. And I have quite experience, really good experience, because I was lived uh, before in USA. So just I'm comparing between what's the services for this age, especially for 16 years and above. Uh, in US and here and thank God by the way Ramadan Kareem for all yeah thank God uh, we see now much of progress that they are concentrating now more in adult services because usually we have early intervention early intervention and hope with time we can hear about uh, vocational training and employment chances for our kids thank you for uh, letting me join you thank you it's nice to have you on board, so uh, we'd be happy to have your input on any of the questions that, that we'll be asking today. Um, so and Esma is on um, oh, now. Perfect. So, so you can, I don't have visibility for all the participants, but she's uh, Asma Abdurrahim. Abdurrahman. So Asma. Yes, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yay, Asma's here. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa hala fi Asma. Can you, please, uh, uh, can you please introduce yourself, if that's all right? My name is Asma Musa Muhammad Abdurrahman. I am uh, a mother of uh, three boys. Uh, the middle one is Yusuf. He is autism, Yusuf Al-Ali. He is now 18 years old. Uh, Alhamdulillah, he finished uh, school. This is the first year here in uh, HCT in Abu Dhabi uh, campus, Abu Dhabi Man's College. Uh, he's studying now media, alhamdulillah. And uh, his hobbies is art, swimmer, he's swimmer, bicycle, he tried to uh, change his sport. And uh, alhamdulillah, everything is okay with Yusuf, but uh, we face some problem now when he's a reach, uh, when he a reach, uh, when he reach 18 years. Maybe it's uh, between, um, you know, COVID and uh, last year from March, we stay at home and he was uh, nervous, uh, angry. He uh, leave all the school and uh, friends, shadow teacher, teachers. Uh, we faced many um, challenge on this uh, that time. I think uh, yeah, I think that's that's a challenge that all of us parents have faced. Yes. Although um, I'm uh, like I'm I'm interested to hear what different experiences everybody has had. So inshallah, we will be talking about that in a little bit more detail um, going forward. But uh, if it's all right, then I'll just uh, I, I really first of all, I'm just very glad uh, to see so many professionals uh, attending today. Um, you too, as uh, as I know very well, have extremely visual, busy schedules. So it really warms my heart to have you take the time to attend this panel discussion with us. Um, so my question to the panelists is, what are the top three things that you wish every professional knew that, that's working with children with autism and their families? So, um, can we start, please, with Marco? Uh, sorry, Marco, I think you're you're uh, you're muted. If you can kindly unmute. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'll tell you one thing. I think Bianca is going to tell the other ones. But um, one thing that uh, we really faced problem during all these years, it was with a speech therapist. Um, we had to change quite a few times. You know, it's it's very tiring mission because you have to explain, you have to all the time, have to go through all that, fill up all the papers, reports, and then tell a story over and over again. And then you realize that a lot of uh, speech therapists, they not, they're not really prepared to deal with uh, autistic kids. They, really, they might be good in their profession, they'd be excellent professionals, but they don't know the, they don't know the basics of the ABA to deal with the kid in the spectrum. 
So basic things like pairing with the kids in the first sessions that would be, you know, that would motivate the kid to come to the session and be happy to be there. They didn't know how to do that. So it was, it became like a stressful journey for the kids, you know, the, for Clara at least. Every time she used to go there, it was like, like tantrums all the time. And every time you had to pay 500 dirhams for one hour session, it was totally unproductive. You know? And then I was a father, I mean, I got involved with ABA. I was trying to do courses and, and, and learn as much as I could. And, but at, at the same time, because it's new for you as well, you, you believe that the professional knows what he's doing. And then by the basic course that you took, you realize, why did she do this at least? I mean, it's not working, you know, just when she goes in the, in the room, she's crying, she doesn't want to stay there, she's throwing things. And also this, the, the professional used to get a bit stressed. No, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. And at the end of the session, nothing was learned because she was not even really interested in being there. So um, this one, one point that for me is, I think every speech therapist should know at least, at least the basic things about ABA in order to start working with the kids in the spectrum. Yeah, th thanks for sharing. And, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, everybody here in attendance will agree. It's it, pairing is really, really important, you know, especially when you're dealing with a young child in the spectrum, even an older child in the spectrum, <laughs> even even an older typically developing child, you know, you, you have to you have to pair properly. And um, so thank you for sharing that. And, you know, also a shout out to all the wonderful speech therapists that I that I've known. Um, I'm like there are heaps uh, that, of wonderful people who do um, who do a great job. But like you said, there are, you know, that's your experience and there are people that um, that could benefit from that. So um, can I just give out a reminder to everybody in the audience? Could you please switch your cameras and microphones off just so that um, we can all see the panelists? That would be great. And um, I'd be happy to hear from Bianca, um, you know, the points that you have that you wish professionals knew. I think um, for me, like what I can see, that's the one of the most important points in any age is that uh, the professional should understand that indiv the individual on the spectrum will read our emotional level on each situation. So um, I, even when things are going wrong, you know, the tone of voice, your body language will make a huge difference at the kid's reaction into the situation, you know, and the behavior, the anxiety, the... Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I believe this is one of the most important points. Doesn't matter how the situation and where the situation is going, you should try to be calm. I know it's not easy, you know, as a parent, I know, like, with our own kids, it's difficult. Imagine with someone else's kids. So I believe, especially with the LSAs, um, because they, they spend most of the time with the kids in the school. So I do believe this is really important. And uh, one other point is um, pre-organize with the family a routine, a schedule for the kid and use visual information uh, in the school. So that will also avoid any kind of stress, anxiety, uh, behavior, uh, tantrum, and uh, yes, I think it's important and also to understand the family background. We are all different individuals and we all come from different like uh, we are Brazilians. We are in a British school with a Filipino LSA. And uh, yes, so it's it is important to understand living in a Muslim country. So we need to understand we have to respect and learn a little bit about everything. And uh, yes, and at the end of the day, with a little bit of love and uh, patience, everything works out. Thank you so much for, for that, Bianca. I think that's such an important point that you bring up. Um, you know, learning that, that, that every family is different. Every family is kind of a, a society in itself, isn't it? And, you know, um, when Mariam was younger, we were living in Australia, so we had a very uh, different uh, background to to uh, to the people that the professionals there mostly saw and even here you know every family is very different so thank you for sharing that 
Um, how about, Khaula, um, what are the top three things that you wish every professional knew uh, working with uh, children with ASD and their families? Just remember to unmute, please. Thank you for the unmute reminder. I needed that. Um, I think the top three, I mean, I'm speaking from where I am now. And I've been really fortunate over the last uh, 14 years because Abdullah actually started speech and OT and all of that from birth um, because of his other issues. And so I think that over those years, having worked with so many different people, it really becomes very clear what are the really most important factors because you know every professional is different just like every you know child and family is different um, and that those differences don't necessarily mean good or bad because I think it's really been beneficial for my son to work with so many different people um, because he's learned to you know at first when I started him at uh, it was then New England Center I remember being panic stricken the first time he was changed um, because I thought no this person is my lifeline and I can't exist without this particular person who knows me now and knows my son but now um, as the parent of a 14 year old who has changed, um, you know, case managers every year and other therapists along the way, I feel that that's been a benefit. And I think that the things that I value most, even the two most important things, is transparency, is just having the ability to really know that whoever's working with your child is going to tell you straight, even if it's unpleasant that they're going to tell you when there's a problem, when they're going to tell you when you have to address something, um, and they're not going to just tell you your son is the cutest, sweetest child they've ever seen. So I think transparency, having, having that ability, and the same token, feeling that you can bring up as a parent something that, you, a concern without offending um, or putting putting the therapist on the defensive. So there really needs to be that transparency. And then also working with someone who really is not going to come in with sort of preconceived notions about what your child needs to be doing. Um, because in Abdullah's case, he's, I feel, in the vast majority of the cases, been able to accomplish more than what people push him to do. And I have heard over the years, um, different therapists tell me, but or and teachers, he's doing well enough. Or they'll tell me about other students that aren't doing as well as my son. Um, and they don't hold him accountable uh, for things. And, and I was telling someone the other day that I literally sent a cake to the first teacher that gave my son detention in mainstream school because I felt like he got it, you know, and holding my son accountable for following roles um, was so, is so important to his development. So I really, really appreciated that. I feel as a parent, you know, I love my son, so it's great when other people love him, but what I really need is a partner in helping him grow into a happy and productive adult. And that's not always, you know, roses. So those would be the two things. Uh, thanks so much for that, Khaula. You know, I'm, uh, well, Abdullah probably got, got quite a few detentions following that cake incident. <laughs> uh, really, he hasn't though, this is the problem. I thought the cake would help, but it Shit. didn't. <laughs> Um, so, you know, but you, you bring up such valid points. They really hit home, I'm sure, like they hit home for myself and they hit home, I'm sure, for, for uh, other parents, you know, on the panel and, and in the audience. And um, uh, and I, I'm really interested to talk about, you know, how we can build relationships um, today. I think that's a really important discussion that we can have. But um, to begin with, can we go ahead and, and hear from Sajada? Uh, what, are, what are the three things that you wish professionals knew if they were working with children with autism, please? Yeah, um, I agree to whatever Bianca, Marco and Kavla shared. Transparency, compassion, you know, these are the things topmost for me. 
when we start um, therapy and when we start looking for therapists as parents, uh, we have a million questions in our head. So when we approach a therapist, I think we as parents, I think we should ask all the questions and clarify all our doubts and, you know, um, uh, understand uh, the program, understand the credentials. Uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, you know, they're going to be our lifeline for some time. Our children are going to be uh, seeing them and taking therapy. So I think as parents, I think parents have the right to know what they are getting in. Having said that, I think as professionals also, we should be transparent. We should be telling them what our program is, how we are going to do the therapy sessions, if possible, get parents involved in the program and, uh, uh, you know, giving them updates and uh, giving them uh, feedbacks uh, every uh, once a week or so. So I think that is very uh, crucial and important. Another point that I would like to say is um, most parents, and I think everybody uh, will agree, all parents are involved in their children's program and uh, the therapy. But uh, for some reason, some of us cannot, the stress here is so high, some of us really cannot do much in spite of us wanting to do because of the stress levels. So uh, it's very easy to kind of point fingers and say sometimes like, you know, we don't have parents as much as involved and they're not doing enough at home. But actually, sometimes even if the best of best help and what a, uh, the parents can do, but still they cannot do because some of them are going through depression. Some of the uh, mothers have going uh, but they burn out. There's a lot going on. So I think as professionals, we have to understand that also. I think parents will always try to do the best for their children. So that is something that I have experienced. And also as a professional, I feel I am aware of that also. Uh, another thing is when parents uh, drop their uh, children for therapy and parents come back to pick their children or from school, um, the feedback given, I think, um, if it is done on an everyday basis, I think as professionals, we should be very aware of what we say, like we should start with the positives, and then talk about any undesirable behaviors, because it's very important, parents have a very tough day, they go through a lot, when they come back, they want to see their children, and they are uh, actually uh, so anxious about what the session was like and you know they're driving fast and coming there to pick up the children so you know um, I have had those days when I have you know I don't know what the setup is going to tell me today hope everything was good today you know my fingers crossed and then when I see their faces and when I see my son's face I feel oh my god hope he had a good session hope he was fine today at the session so there's a lot going on um, so I think uh, as therapists and as professionals, we have to be mindful of that. So these are some of the top things that come to my mind. Wow, Sajada, those are like such amazing points, uh, you know, just spot on. I have absolutely nothing to add to that. Just to say, you know, that's exactly I'm sure how how um, how so many parents feel. Um, Shall we move on to Esma? Could, can you tell us uh, some of the things that you wish professionals knew working with children with autism? Uh, I will talk about my son, Yusuf. He is 18 now. Uh, the main things professionals must know about uh, this, this age, for this age, uh, psychology. We need, until now, I am not, uh, I didn't find any psychologists uh, for adults autism. Uh, how to deal with them, how to know what's in his, in his, in his mind. Uh, now, in this age, for me, as until uh, age 16, I, I control everything with Yusuf, alhamdulillah, yani. After 16, until now, the... Yusuf, he have something we cannot understand. We go to many doctors, 
to understand what he is, how can we deal with Yusuf uh, because his uh, behavior and his thinking between uh, teenager, uh, it's combination, teenager and adults. Uh, teenager as uh, uh, adults and sometimes he's autism. So we have combination for this behaviors and the reaction from Yusuf, we surprised really, and we surprised last uh, six months. Yusuf reactions, it's same as uh, when he was six years autism. So uh, the main things which we need now for uh, I think all this uh, all the autism kids now he is 14, six, eight, they will become sure after many years, 18. We need professional for the psychologist for autism only. They know how to uh, deal with autism, adult autism, not the uh, kids with autism. This is my points. That this is what I need. I uh, recommended this one. This is my points. Uh, that's that's a really really good point, Esma. Um, you know, like my daughter Maryam is now twelve years old. Um, to me, she's still a little baby, but I know that, like yeah. in the eyes of everybody else, she's a, she's a twelve year old girl, and um, and it is a worry in the back of my head always. You know what happens when she grows out of school. You know what support is available, sure. and I I completely agree that um, uh, inshallah, yani, inshallah there will be professionals in the field who do look at uh, adults with ASD you, you know autism doesn't go away at the age of 18 mm, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah that's a really really valid point so um i have another question well i have another few questions for our panelists which i think professionals would really benefit from from hearing the answers to but um if i can just uh, go back to one of the points um that you made khawla um, and that's a point I really appreciate um, regarding the transparent relationships between professionals and parents, you know, and, you know, Sajjali, you mentioned that and, it, you know, Marco, you, you, you highlighted the importance of that as well. Because, um, you know, firstly, I, I have so much respect and, you know, I've always had, I've always, you know, very from, from the very beginning, I've always had heaps of respect for for the individuals that choose to work in this field. I think, you know, they're amazing. Um, so it's always been really, really important to me to have a, a very good relationship with those who work with and those who support my daughter, because, you know, I know what she's like. <laughs> she can be a handful, so, you know, respect to them. Um, but I, I'd like to ask our, our panelists, do you have any advice for how professionals can help build transparent, trusting relationship with parents from their side? Marco, you, you hinted a few points before, but if you'd like to um, uh, go ahead and explain it in a bit more detail, I'd appreciate that. Uh, yes, um, since from the very beginning, what I what I make it very clear to the professionals or to the teachers in school, I always tell them, please tell me whatever you feel like. Don't hide anything, as Cole said. It's nice when you're honest to, no matter what, most of the time you're going to get some bad news, but it's through the bad news that you know exactly what's, what's happening, you know, and then we, we can work on it. It, it's really hard when you, in the beginning, when she was, before diagnosis, when she was uh, in, the, in the kindergarten. And uh, every day you say, oh, no, she's good, no, she's fine. You know, so they never told us exactly what's, go, what's going on until we realized, okay, something is, is going on, you know? And then we went for the diagnosis. But even now, when the first time when you go, you know, to a school or to any professional, please tell us the truth, you know, but it doesn't matter. You don't need to go around, go straight forward and tell us what's going on and what can we do. Let's work as a team. The first thing is be transparent, work as a team, because we need to have this team of professionals. We need to be surrounded by this kind of a group, you know, otherwise it won't work. If it, everybody's like, you know, separated, you, you won't work for your child. So you, it's really important to be transparent, communication, openly, you know, and uh, yeah, and, and be clear. You know, that's why even though 
you know, some I know that some professions they don't they are not clear because some parents reactly react differently. You know, so well, my son cannot do it can't be my son. No, it is not my son. But you know, if the, the professional, the teacher, for example, is telling you some, this is what's happening. Maybe you should work on this. And um, I know that this is not professional, but in, I work as a flight attendant, and I, I clearly saw a couple of families on the airplane once that was, I could say that the, the, the child was in the, uh, in the spectrum. And I didn't know it. I felt like telling them because I knew most probably didn't know anything about it. And then once I had one passenger, it was an Indian family, and uh, I spoke with him, listen, I'm not saying that this is happening, but it's happened to my daughter. As soon as you get to your destination, look for some professionals that maybe you can help your, your child, you know. But I didn't say what it was, but I told them, you know, go for it. Don't, don't go for the doctors that say, no, it's fine, you know, he's only four years old because he speaks two languages, that's why he, he, spe he has a speech delay. Things like that, I tell. I told them, you no, know, look for a professional. Don't, don't. If something is wrong, look for other alternatives. Don't, don't, don't believe in those professions that everything is good at all the time. You, know, you have to share. You have to be clear about it. Um, thanks for that input, Marco. Can I just say, Sajada, I think you might be uh, sharing your screen by accident. I just want to. Uh, make sure that so there's a little arrow there's a little arrow on the chat and you can just unshare or would it be an x is it okay now and uh, no, you're still sharing so if you go to teams if you open the teams okay i'm so sorry about that you can just click if you click on my face actually <laughs> OK. It's the little X next to the red yeah, button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, uh, I get it. These okay. things happen. Thank you. Yeah. That's OK. That's OK. Come, it comes with the platform, doesn't it? So um, thank you again, uh, Marco, for that input. Uh, I think that's really important. Khaula, I'd love to hear from you um, uh, regarding this question. You know, you brought it up. It's an important topic, and I think you, we could benefit from, from your thoughts. Unmuting myself. Um, I think for me, what works best is just starting out from a place where, you know, if the therapist isn't sort of laying out their process and, and how they want to work with you, you can start that conversation yourself and say, you know, this is what's important to me. And, you know, you want to have, you know, just stating what you want, that you want to be able to have a transparent relationship in which, you know, the therapist is able to say uncomfortable things to you or, you know, not not critical, but just objective observations. You know, my son is going to be he's going to be very charming at points and I'm happy to hear about that, but he's going to be really, really difficult at points also. And I need to know about that. And, you know, just offering, I think, yourself as a team member. Um, and then just really, you know, filtering any future communications through kind of, you know, is this like, you know, going to help create a stronger team or or not. I think that I see a lot of parents who become frustrated for a variety of reasons, and, and many, many of them are very legitimate. Um, but, you know, instead of maybe going to their primary teacher or case manager or therapist, they go to, you know, a supervisor or a principal or someone and they, they voice their um, concerns, which maybe that needs to happen but i think it again it needs to happen that's not really team building in that case and that those are some of the things i think as parents maybe we do to create like uh tension um and you know just continuing to reinforce like an open dialogue i think that's the the most you can do um and and i think in time you know that that does pay off that's a that's a really that's a really great great uh, great point and it's a great tip I think uh, you know for parents you know maybe.
some professionals just need that need that upfront kind of you know i'm open to have this conversation i'm open to hear about everything uh, about my child the good the bad anything in between um i think that's a really important point and just from the chat we have a question which says for new professionals this transparency can be difficult how would you suggest starting that type of relationship with a parent especially being able to pair without crossing ethical borders so do you have any any thoughts on that Khaula? Um, I mean, I think, you know, obviously my my experience is from the parent side, so I see that side much more clearly. I don't have the dual role that um, that you do, but I think the same way of just, you know, trying to be consistent because I think it doesn't happen overnight. You know, um, par as parents, I think, you know, when your child gets to a certain age, every parent would say they've had some, you know, maybe disappointing experiences or even bad experiences and the same on the side of the professional i'm sure you know you have parents that only want to hear that their child is um you know doing well and perfect and better than anyone else and i think this goes for mainstream teachers as well you have those parents um and and you know so so this can take time i think to develop but you you have to be consistent and when I think of, you know, in the last few years when I've had, uh, you know, people working with my son that I think were very hesitant to be transparent with me, it was just a matter of being consistent in what I was saying um, and saying, you know, I know that some parents may not want to hear these types of things, but I do. Um, and that's how that's how that's what I value and that's what I need. Um, and again, just continuing to offer your support. So I think the flip side could work as well. You know, if, if a therapist lets a parent know, you know, I have your child for X number of hours a week, and this is what I'm going to be working on. But I would really like to be able to extend what I'm doing by having a good working relationship with you or, you know, your family members, or if there's nannies, you know, whatever is available. And just, you know, continuing to, to offer that and, and, and say that you know repeatedly maybe in different ways and you know I think that's the best you can do right is just to keep to keep trying yeah like I, I, I agree I think that's great advice I think you know um, it's it's great for the parent to come forward and say you know give me that transparency tell me all the information but at the same time you know it can it can come from from the therapist or the professional first you know they can say look we can do it how you want to do it do you want you know is it a bit too difficult for you to hear to hear you know about every single detail or, or do you want to, to know about those details we can keep yeah. you in the loop or we can we can tell you you know if you're if if you have lots going on we can you know give you uh, small summaries but i think Sajada, you you would be the perfect person to to answer this question you know as with that dual role of being a professional and a parent could could you pr please advise us yeah thank you um, I agree to what all of you shared and I would like to add a few things. Um, I think talk to listen. So sometimes you just have to let parents share their concerns and pick on uh, what are their top concerns. Listen to what they want and prioritize what you're going to be working on. Um, as much as parents are uh, concerned about the well-being and progress of the child, I think we should also understand that a professional is equally interested in seeing the progress and uh, in any child that they're working with. So like Kavla shared, it is something that doesn't happen overnight. Trust is something that takes a while. It, uh, you know, it takes a period of time to have the neutral trust and respect. So, um, I think be open and transparent. I totally agree to that and share and listen to each other. You kind of did I make sense? Absolutely. Like I, I think, you know, I think that makes perfect sense. And um, 
you know I, I yeah I, I think uh, I think that's good advice for 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 professionals and um, and also maybe good advice for parents you know like uh, it's it's a two-way road and um, um, and everybody has to make that first step you know you can't wait for the parent to make the step uh, all the time and at the same time it can't all, always be coming just from the professional and you know and I think it's it's really important for professionals to realize you know these are our kids um, they, you know we do put them first we do want what's best for them we might not have the educational background we might not have um, the years of experience to to know you know uh, like what reinforcement is and and um, uh, you know and how to how to deal best with it with any given situation but you know I bet you anything you know we will do what we can and um, if we're provided with the right information uh, the right support and um, and I'm not just speaking for myself it's we are not the minority of parents who 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 want to do this you know all parents want what's best for their kids so um, I think that's just really important for professionals to keep in mind and I know that so many people do so um, hats off to you um, so um, is there anything that, that anybody uh, from the panel would like to ask or would you like to uh, move on to um, to discussing the pandemic <laughs> Perfect. So um, we're having some great uh, comments in the chat and some great questions. Uh, if it's all right, um, we'll try and answer most of the questions towards the end, uh, just for the sake of time. Um, but um, if there are any questions that we don't, don't get to, like I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, we will try and respond to you um, later on via email uh, or however we can. So. Um, we can't go through a webinar these days without bringing up the global pandemic. <laughs> um, professionals and parents alike have, you know, everybody in the world has experienced uh, very drastic changes over the past, oh, I was going to say the past year, but it's been longer, hasn't it? Um, so uh, how has, I want to ask the parents and Esma, I'll give you a chance to, to go into more detail about how this has affected your, yourself and your family. How has the COVID pandemic impacted upon your child with ASD and also your role as a parent? So Esma, could, could I give the yes. mark to you? Okay. Uh, for Yusuf, uh, he was in secondary school the last year, last uh, the beginning of the COVID on March. And uh, he has full day working, yani all online from 8 morning to 8 evening. Uh, after uh, cl school classes, uh, he have um, uh, sport, he have art, he have sessions for behavior support. But um, uh, you know, we faced some big problem. We we shocked me and my her husband, his father, that Yusuf, he feel that he's the best one. Uh, all the behavior classes when he have sessions online, um, he th he thought that he we don't know what he is he's doing in this online. We don't know what his uh, his uh, reaction with the teachers. We don't know most of these thi things. We thought that Yusuf he he is oh oh he is going uh, good everything going good. Then uh, Yusuf he was uh, he he is moving again same he's uh, before when he was six years moving in the uh, home. He's thinking he's. Um, feeling that he's uh, lazy he tried to be better but uh, he, he don't know what he's inside what he's thinking his mind he he feel that confused so uh, we take yusuf to many uh, some doctors online also sessions they told us that uh, from uh, this affected all the people like this but uh, he become angry too much angry yani uh, he's fighting uh, 
uh, alhamdulillah after uh, secondary in August he become better but on uh, October no it's effective too much maybe because he's changing uh, from school to uh, university and he could he didn't go to the campus he don't know that uh, how we how he will study uh, I told you from the from beginning he came as a six years same same behaviors Alhamdulillah, now he's 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 become okay now, better than before, because uh, we try to we try we to understand him, we try to uh, take him to some of um, um, psychologists. They help us in this uh, area, but uh, really, really, it was uh, difficult for us. Challenge challenges the last uh, year, yani. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, like I, uh, I just want to say, um, good job for for dealing with uh, with that. You know, as a mother, as a parent, um, I think that you know, I just want to say, you know, I I think that you've you've done a really good job in terms of uh, how how you've you've dealt with it and trying to find the best professional advice. It's not an easy job. And um, especially with the with the pandemic and, you know, having to have online uh, online sessions and online consultations. So um, I just want to say uh, I'm glad that, that Yusuf uh, is progressing a little bit better now. And um, and I think that we've all really a lot of a lot of parents have really struggled during the pandemic. I know for one that I have. Um, can we hear from from some of the other parents? Um, uh, Khawla, can you can you tell me how have you found like um, maybe moving to online? Um, well, I mean, you know, we all were kind of thrown into it. And um, in our case, Abdullah didn't. Abdullah is actually very social. He likes being like around people, so he really struggled, um, didn't want anything to do with online, but I mean, now a year into it, I would say that academically, I don't think it's been, you know, I think it's been a disaster. You know, if you look at what, because Abdullah does have like kind of an academic program, and I think that's been a complete and total disaster. Um, but it ha was helpful for me to be involved in his classes because, um, you know, he is older now. And so, he, and he doesn't tell me much about what happens. You know, how was your day? Fine. What did you do? Nothing. Um, so again, you're left with what the teachers kind of give you as a summary. So I actually did find it very beneficial to be like looped in to how he was reacting to teachers, how he was reacting to peers. Like when he doesn't want to do something, like I, I could figure out sort of in some cases, why he was resistant to some um, situations where I was struggling before to to know because I wasn't there with my eyes on it. So so that was helpful, and I think that we focused on trying to do what we could. And his relationship, like with his siblings, has really strengthened in this pandemic, which I'm so grateful for. Um, I'm so grateful to his sisters for being so, you know, connected to him and, you know, that even though the academic has been a disaster, you know, I look at that bond that's really strengthened and I think that is going to positively impact him so much in the future. Um, so I consider that a big, a big win. So I think with the pandemic, it's a matter of just accepting I mean, you try, you know, we've tried our best with the academic, but recognizing, you know, maybe that portion is a disaster, but it doesn't mean that everything has to be a disaster. Um, so it's maybe shifting your focuses and, and again, readjusting your expectations because um, there's always something you can make positive, hopefully. Yeah, inshallah. yeah, yeah, inshallah, inshallah, like, you know, spot on, Khawla, I think, you know, <laughs> it's very difficult when, you know, when you're struggling and your child is struggling and, um, you know, and, and you know, even as parents, you know, um, Esma, you mentioned your son in online working, you know, 
for me, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing my master's and I'm struggling with online. You know, it's, it was much easier for me when we used to go to the campus. Um, inshallah, um, that'll be back soon, but who knows? Um, uh, but uh, I'd really like to hear, I, I like hearing the good news uh, about the pandemic and the good stories that have come out of it. Um, Bianca, can you tell me, can you tell me about your story, please, with the, with your daughter? Hi, yes, um, with us, um, Marco can tell you more, but because he was the one really working close to Clara and he was amazing. We didn't have any help, you know, even um, the nanny was not home. It was just three of us. We travel quite a lot, Marco. Both of us all the time. And uh, Marco created this routine at home to do the homeschooling with her. It was a huge challenge, but at the same time, um, he could see more than me that how much we can help our kid, you know, and we think we cannot do anything. We are like sometimes even losers because in the beginning we were like, oh my God, how, how the teachers manage to teach these kids. And, uh, and then at the end, Clara was not really, uh, she was struggling with writing and Marco was doing so much research about that and how he could help Clara, which material he could use. And at the end, she, when she, after one year, when she went back to school, she was at the same level as her colleagues, her peers. And that was amazing, you know, to see her progress and how much we were able to help Clara. And even to be, very honest, it's a funny thing, but we were like kind of celebrating how much we could save <laughs> because we didn't have all those uh, therapies. Like uh, we were like, Marco, that's so great. And uh, yes, but of course, uh, she was missing so much her colleagues and her friends. She was missing be at the nature, doing the swimming class and doing her things. And she was asking to see her friends. And uh, yes, and now that she's back to school, she's struggling to be back to the new normal where like she needs to do all the classes in the classroom. She's not able to run on the field to do her music class. She loves to sing, she loves to dance, she loves to be outdoors, she loves to do gardening things, and she's not able to do that. And of course, this is a big challenge. And she's, she's not, um, she doesn't know how to express that to us, to tell us, mommy, you know, I want to be free. And you know, like the autistic kids, they really want to be free. They want to run, they want to, to breathe, they want to feel the sun. And I feel that's uh, one thing that she's really struggling at the moment after the pandemic. But I would say it was a, it was a positive thing to our family. Alhamdulillah, you know, that that just that that makes me feel so good. And uh, I'd love to hear more, Marco, about about just how uh, how it was, you know, to to work, uh, to be the, the therapist, the parent, the teacher uh, to to uh, Clara while she was uh, while she was stuck at home, basically. Uh, in the beginning, you <laughs> you have the expectations, you have the reality, right? In the first day, you're, you're excited, you create that environment, let's do this, let's do that. But then you realize that things don't work the way you planned, right? Um, I realized, you now every day you had like a, a bunch of slides, you know, from the school, we had to go through all those things. And then you realize that the, their pace was totally different from your kid. So not only that, uh, I had to cope with Clara because if I had the iPad in front of her, she wanted to play with the iPad. I said, no, we're going to do this first. And then when you realize the amount of slides that she had to go through, about 12 slides, I mean, she can't be, not be seated for 12 slides, just going one slide by slide. So I had to go through the slide. I had to, you know, to find out the different ways and print out things, you know, to work with her and minimize the time that she would spend on the screen. Because sometimes when she used to see the screen, she, she was shouting, I don't want to do the screen, I don't want to do this. So I had to find out other ways to work with her. Uh, as Bianca said, the very positive thing was when I knew that a lot of behaviors that was happening at school is the fact that she was asked to write something, but her letter formation was still very poor, you know. So, of course, she would get stressed out, you know. So I spoke with a friend of mine 
she used to live in Abu Dhabi, now Teresa, now she's back in Brazil. And she said, Mark, give two steps back, start working from the basics with the phonics, you know, Jolly Phonics, start, and then create like a, another program. I got that program called uh, Writing Without Tears. So I started doing that from the very beginning. And then by the end, after three months, she already was like perfect with the, the, the letter formation. Now she could focus on the, the, on the word formation, which would be easier for her. So we started working with um, phonics, dictation, and it was way, much, was way better for her. So she got more confident, you know. It was stressful, and at, at, at the point, it was really hard to follow the program. So I quit some subjects, like, like Arabic, um, computer, I basically I focused on the math in, in, in English, even though English is not my first language, it became more difficult at the end, you know, to, to find a ways how to teach her. Math, I could do that. You know, I can find ways in the internet, it can be more creative, but to get the creative out of her and make her write the way they were doing, every single day there was a new subject, you know, coming up, it was really stressful at that point. So. But as in the aftermath, I, I would say it was, it was amazing. It was, to spend time at home and teaching her and, you know, see her progress was really rewarding. That's that's really amazing. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes you do have to take, you know, one step forward, two steps back in order to, to get there. And, you know, uh, that's fine, you know. Um, so um, I'm really glad uh, that, uh, that things uh, went well. Well, I guess for Clara during the, the pandemic, um, can I just, I'd like to ask like what, what professional support did like, and this is open to all panelists, whoever wants to answer, but like um, what uh, professional support did you benefit for, from during the pandemic? We have a great question in the chat. It says, were you able to access behavioral support? Like aside from academics, were you able to access behavioral support and how did that work? Uh, go ahead, Khaula, yeah. Well, uh, I wouldn't, in, in my situation, having my son online, I mean, he's now back in school, but when he was online, ironically, it really helped the transparency and my relationship, I think, with his primary teacher, because we could finally, in real time, work together. So my son has a lot of issues with non-compliance because when he thinks something is meaningless, then he just thinks he doesn't have to do it. So instead of, you know, hearing those stories later and not really being able to, you know, explain it well to my son, like what was this consequence for, we could do it in real time. So that I actually felt was very helpful. So it wasn't really, um, let's say, behavioral support in in the fact that the teachers were you know creating plans but it was just being taking advantage of the situation um and being able to work together to to make some progress thank you um Sujada, as, a, as a parent uh like were there any um behavioral supports that you had uh during the pandemic um, he is 23, so most of the intervention, like um, he's not having any intervention except that he's going into a center now. Um, otherwise, uh, one important thing uh, I would like to add to this is as much as academics uh, uh, on a regular, when they go to school, we focus on academics and communication. Uh, we also have to focus a lot on having a routine, uh, teaching our children functional skills, leisure skills, which is very important because a time like this, when everybody is at home and you all have, uh, we all have our own stuff to do, when children do not have uh, enough functional skills or leisure skills, it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, so I think it is very important right from the beginning we start looking at leisure skills and functional skills. Um, you know, some of the families I know, they can uh, bring in help. Um, they have to do everything around the house. It's so important, you know, when our children can contribute towards this, you know, 
to do stuff around the house and help around the house it's it's a great great thing so i think as parents we should focus on functional and leisure skills and it has really helped me because he has been a big helper in the house for all of us and um i think uh, he's taken well to his online uh, lessons also he's doing uh, pretty well and some of the other classes like he used to have keyboard classes and uh, computer classes some physical training those are things that we have not been able to do but uh, we both exercise in the evening together so it's been some fun time for both of us together and i uh, he's my only child so i have all the time in the world Oh, that's that's uh, such such an important point about functional skills, and I think I'll have to catch up with you later and get you to teach me how how to work with Miriam on on doing some house chores. <laughs> um, but but you know you you bring up such an important uh, point, and um, uh, you know functional skills are really important. Um, like regard with regards to the question, can I just ask um, if if it's uh, all right with you to answer? Was the center that your son attends closed for a while during the pandemic? Are you asking me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. The center was closed for some time. They have reopened, but he's not yet started going into the center now. He's still oh. doing online. Oh right, right, right. Great. We got so, vaccinated, but yet we've not been confident yes. to send him in. Sure. Yeah, like, um, you know, my daughter also attends MRC Nick and um, um, so, you know, like, so that was the that was closed for for a while and then they reopened for a while and they closed again for a while and um, and it's just the pandemic, you know, it's like this all over the world. Um, like, if, if it's all right, I'll share my own experience. Um, so uh, during during COVID, it was a really difficult time. Um, I think um, you mentioned leisure activities. Uh, you know, there were very few activities uh, th that Maryam has interest in, and they're mostly like, you know, swimming and going to the park and jumping and like kind of those those activities that were really unavailable for 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 a while. You know, all the parks were closed. Closed. All the swimming pools were closed. Um, the the games in the malls were all closed. Um, you know there there are only so many you know so many things that we have at the house, uh, and um, and you know school was out. So that also meant that her routine was out. And um, uh, and you know so she wasn't sleeping. Uh, her food routine was all over the place. Um, and you know during the height of it, really. Uh, Every tiny thing was was a real, real struggle uh, for 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 us with Mariam at, at the house, um, and uh, you know, uh, in terms of support. So, like, I'll just and this is this is for for the professionals. Um, like, uh, and also if you have any experiences yourselves that you'd like to share uh, for the parents. But um, you know, I had like I'll, I'll just give you an example. So I had. Uh, I communicated with with many people during the pandemic and uh, so many people were supportive, but obviously there's limited things that they could do. But I'll give you an example of an excellent um, communication experience that I had with with a professional and a maybe not so excellent uh, communication experience. And um, so it like so both like both conversations were, had actually the exact same outcomes you know at the end of the uh, at the end of the conversation neither provided me with any new information because they didn't have any um neither um provided any physical support because you know they couldn't due to covid restrictions and neither of them um you know spent more time than the other listening to what i had to say really um the only difference was um um in like from the good experience they just it's, it was just their response they just said you know oh my gosh i can't imagine how difficult it must be for you you know mariam bless her she just needs her routine and it's changed for everybody it must be so difficult you're doing a great job saying staying strong for her during this time make sure that you take care of yourself as well as much as you can and you know i'm feeling i'm facing similar issues with my own kids at home and just call me anytime that you need to 
and that was the gist of the conversation. And at the end of that, I just felt like there was somebody there to support me and that I had that kind of professional support, even though nothing had really changed. Compared to another conversation, which I'm sure that, you know, it might not have been intentionally dismissive, um, but, you know, the response was, well, we haven't, we, we don't have any information to give you. Um, sorry, you know, you can, we'll just wait for the authorities to communicate any changes. You can maybe talk to other people, other individuals, other professionals, other bodies and see what they have to say. And it's just those tiny, tiny differences. They didn't say anything, you know, bad or inappropriate or unsupportive, but it just makes that huge difference to parents to, to you know, to hear that, you know, we're happy for you to contact us, even if we're out of school, even if we're facing our own issues with the pandemic. I think that's really important. So um, would anybody like to add anything to that? I would just say that, you know, I've had similar experiences and I think, you know, like you, I think it was great that you pointed out that the end result was the same. You know, nothing changed. The, both people were unable to do anything to help you. And you probably knew that going in, but one had made the effort to connect with you and let you know that, you know, they understood, like you felt heard. And, and the other person, you know, I mean, they, I'm sure they were going through and maybe they were deluged with all kinds of parents wanting stuff, wanting stuff and feeling just completely drained. But they were just essentially saying, I can't do anything. You have to go elsewhere. And it's just it's a very subtle difference, but it makes a huge difference in how you feel. Yeah, the number one thing was isolation, right, for everyone. And, you know, especially when you have you know, a child with, you know, complex needs, it, it's even more isolating. And you just need that little lifeline of knowing someone is out there who understands because not all your friends and not all your family understands. And your work colleagues and, and the people in your life, they don't really understand. But the people that work with our children, they do understand. And so when they can let us know that they they hear the struggle, it means a lot. Absolutely. And um, Marco, I saw your hand up just there. Yeah, just quickly, just, uh, you know, taking this, talking about the same subject. Um, yeah, during the pandemic, of course, we had some struggles. I didn't know exactly what to do. And I would like to emphasize the importance of having a team. You know, even it's like an old team, like with Nipa, Sajat, we had uh, an old team since Clara was two years old. But even though we are not working together anymore, there's still the team that I normally run to. I say, this is happening, what should I do? You know, this gives a huge support, a huge, it's like a sort of a comfort, you know, that you know that in case you need, you can call someone and give you a support, give you help, or give you some, just exchange a few words of, why don't you try this? Have you done this and that? like simple things that makes a huge difference. That's the importance of having the team and, and, and keep this team for as much as you can because they know your child, they know the, the, her potential. And then if, you, if, you are not, if you, you've been like a, a great team since, since the very beginning, you know you, you can always count on them, it's nice. Um, yeah, that's that's a wonderful experience, and and there are there are there are people that you know take the time out of their their own personal lives and um, you know and care for your child you know nearly as much as you you do. So um, um, that's that's really nice of you to say. So um, that is really really amazing. We've had some. Uh, uh, I'm just I'm really conscious of time, you know, I wish we could go on forever and ever talking about the, you know, everything. <laughs> it feels like years of, of, of things, but I'm sure that this will be the first of many. And I'm so glad that um, that it's become important for people, uh, for professionals to um, to you know take time out of their their time, out of their schedules and say, look, we want to listen to you as parents. Um, and I think uh, a very important thing is um, like, uh, you know, for professionals, uh, they work so hard and they give so much to our children. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really, um, it's very, 
it's good to to remember just a small piece of advice from my side like um so if if you're if you're a behavior therapist and Sujata, I'm sh like I'm sure you can give me your input on this but if you're uh, go ahead is anybody I think this is the mic on by accident. Oh, okay. Dr. Cloda? Yeah, I think that was just a microphone went on by accident. Yeah. Oh, no worries at all. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, yeah, so as I was saying, one, one, one point which I'm sure, Sajala, you can uh, give your input on would be um, uh, just in terms of like from a parent's perspective. Um, so if you're if you're a therapist or an OT or a speech or or uh, or you you're a teacher or you work with a child with autism, um, then you're working you're working a fixed hour job. So you go in the mornings, whether it's like seven, eight a.m. You finish three, four p.m. You have your sessions. They're exhausting. They're tiring. You give all of your energy to those um, individuals. But at the end of the day, and I'm sure like everybody has their own commitments as well, but at the end of the day, you you can go home and a lot of you can do your own things and do your own schedules and take your own leisure time, your own self-care maybe. But for parents, um, it's really a 24 hour job. You know, we're there during the nights, we're there during the afternoons, we're there when schools are closed and um, it's it's, it's a it's not even a full time job. It's kind of a 24 seven job and um, and it, it'd be just just take that into consideration when you when you think, oh, you know, I gave that parent, yeah, you know, that parents, you know, a program to work on and they haven't done it with their kid or, or something like that. I think, you know, it's just something to keep in mind, you know, that that parent is is dealing with it 24 seven, even when we drop our kids off. Like you mentioned before, Sajada, the whole time we we're like, oh my God, you know, what is Miriam doing today? You know, did she ha did she eat her food? Did, like the other day, um, this is just aside from the point, but um, the other day Miriam ate all of her food on the bus. So she arrived and I was like, oh my God, she ate nothing. But of course she didn't. She was provided with food. <laughs> she didn't starve. Um, but um, but the point is, you know, like we do, we do, it's it's 24-7 uh, job and um so Jada, you know, like, what's it like? You're you're a therapist, and you're also um, you're also a mother. So, okay. Um, to begin with, I have flexible hours. I picked up my time when uh, to work when he's at school or at the center. So I actually drop him off at the center. I go to work, finish my work, and then pick him up and come home. And then rest of the day we are together. So that kind of helps me. But now because of the current uh, situation, uh, everybody is working from home. So I, uh, again, I have also uh, my work timings and his um, online sessions. I have, uh, you know, scheduled it in that way that I'm able to help him also. But uh, having said that, he is quite independent um, and that's something a big plus that's come out of this. Uh, he's able to manage his online session with very minimal help from me. So um, that is a progress that I have seen in him, in him and he's made that. Um, apart from that, uh, actually there was a question about burnout. Mothers, some somebody had posted that. So. Where we are working, we are with our children, and with all this in mind, I think we should, as parents, take the time, um, you know, to uh, just to unwind and relax, which is very important for us to bounce back the next day and uh, once in a while go on um, fa family trips or some trips with your friends, um, you know, on a weekend, go out with your friends, whatever that is you know, makes you to uh, uh, energize yourself and come back. I think it is important. Do not feel guilty about leaving your children and going away. It's very important. It's okay. You're doing good to yourself and to them. So um, I think these are some things I have learned these all these years that it's important that you have me time. They have the me time and 
uh, it's perfectly fine to take these breaks. Thank you so much for that. Like that is such uh, an important point that you make. And um, uh, it is, I think, something that uh, some parents feel a bit um, uh, anxious about, but it's a really, really important point that you make for professionals and for parents. Um, so I'd just like to wrap up. Like I said, we could go on forever, but um, <laughs> we don't have forever. There's another session coming up. So just to access CEUs, there's a link in the chat and also there's a link in the chat for uh, an evaluation form for today's session. Uh, we would love it if you could uh, take the time to fill those out. Thank you so, so, so much to everybody who's attended. Um, it's Ramadan, it's, you know, 5 p.m. coming up. I know that it's a difficult time for most people, but I really, really appreciate you being here. And thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. Um, wish you all the best with your children. And a special thanks to Dr. Cloda for arranging this session. And of course, to Dr. Michelle for arranging today's um, uh, today's webinars. Uh, and we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much.